welcome to our chat with the author of our upcoming production of Parfumery at Kelsey Theater, which will be running from November 24th to December 3rd, and that's at Mercer County Community College. Uh, we're having a little chat today with the author. His name is Edward Dowdall. Uh, he's the nephew of the original author, and I'm going to try to pronounce this, Ed, before I bring you up. The original play was called El, El Zatzasar, something like that. I'm going to let you pronounce it better than I am. I can't even read. Uh, so I'd like to welcome in Ed. Ed, how are you? I'm good. How are you, Rob? Glad I'm, to be here. I, oh, I'm so happy you're here. How would you pronounce the original play? It's I L L A T S Z E E S Z E R T A R. So it's Ilat Ser Tar. Ilat Ser Tar. Ilat Ser Tar. There we go. Now that, I that's can... perfect. Thank you. Ilat Ser Tar. <laughs> <laughs> so Ilat Ser Tar was the original play written, I guess, uh, mid to late 30s. I think the copyright is 1936, is it? I think it's 38, actually. 38. Yeah. Um, it's set in 1937, Budapest, Hungary, and uh, there have been a few adaptions from this original, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit. But for those watching, uh, and if you're not familiar with it, uh, the Broadway musical from the early 60s called She Loves Me, there was a, a fine uh, revival of it a few years ago. Uh, the Shop Around the Corner with Jimmy Stewart and Frank Morgan. Also with Judy Garland and S.E. Skazal. We'll talk about him a little bit, too, I believe. Uh, that's from In the Good Old Summertime. Recently, uh, with Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan, You've Got Mail. All of these entities were adapted from your uncle's original play. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, uh, I, I, I want to know, how did he feel about his work uh, being adapted with such names as Jimmy Stewart and Judy Garland, Frank Morgan? Um, and I understand he was a, a close friend to S.E. Skazal, if people know him Sakal. as Sakal. Cuddles, right? Cuddles Sakal, right. Sakal, okay. Right. Just like Bacall, only with an S. Oh, uh, okay. Um, he Well, he was fond of the movies. They went to the movies. He was a big fan of Jimmy Stewart, so I'm... I'm sure he was tickled to have Jimmy Stewart in the George role, and when that when that premiered, um, you know, Essie Sakal being a, a, a close friend, I have a lot of correspondence, especially from the '60s when "She Loves Me" premiered. From you know, personal notes from him saying, "Congratulations, I hope the show's a success." So that's a nice bit of memorabilia to to have. Um, yeah, and you've got mail um, of all of the iterations. You've got mail actually doesn't follow the story quite so closely. The other two are really taken from the original script and then also adapt some adaptation and additions were done by um, the person, his name escapes me at the moment, who did the, uh, uh, who did the first adaptation, the first screenplay with uh, Jimmy Stewart and uh, added some a few things in there that were wonderful that people now expect to see in every version that my uncle didn't write, but <laughs> it's in there nevertheless. So yeah, he was very excited about all these things. I know I have, I even have, is this it? Yeah, I even have some of these. Yeah, good old summertime. It was like the original RCA building, you know, program from uh, in the good old summertime. So that's kind of neat when there was there was organ music and a show and all that kind of stuff, and then the movie. So it was kind of a, a neat time to go to the movies. I understand now. Uh, what is your what what is your uncle's name, and can you talk about the process of how he? was able to sell his story to the uh, to the movies. The first one, I believe, was The Shop Around the Corner with Jimmy Stewart. Sure. I, I, I And also, yeah, just to, to finish also the, the You've Got Mail, I was making, I was just saying that 
Nora Ephron was very fond of the play and her version actually didn't follow the play that closely, but she gave credit that in the opening credits of the movie to say that it was inspired by the play. So yeah, there's still two people that are arguing with each other that don't really know each other and they're corresponding through email in this case, and they're running into each other in the real world. So there's a lot of it there, but you know, everything else has all these other adaptations have been, this is the script, you know? So I'm sorry. So yeah, I don't really know what the details are of how he first hooked up with Ernst Lubitsch, uh, who was the producer. But again, there was this, this sort of great, Hungarian, Jewish, Hungarian infrastructure in New York City, in Yorkville. And uh, I'm sure that, you know, it, it just kind of was kind of in the consciousness. And when Ernst Lubitsch was looking to do something to make a movie, I guess he thought of my uncle because he knew him and said, hey, Miklos, let's do this for a movie. What do you think? That'd be my guess anyway. Well, so you... More recently, you adapted this from your uncle's original uh, uh, translation, I believe. that we, we had spoken before about this. So uh, what was the process for you to, to bring this in and, and make a, a play? What, why did you do it? And uh, around what time did you do that? Because we hadn't heard about this uh, uh, until more recently. Right. Well, the, the play was you know, never produced in English in the United States. And there was no English copyright. So somewhere around like 1938, and maybe that's what I'm thinking of for the copyright, the English speaking copyright, my aunt and uncle, I'm sure felt my aunt was very on it in terms of knowing that this thing, these copyrights need to be kept alive and updated. I mean, those, those rules became much more easy to manage as late as I think the seventies, when it began to be a thing where you didn't have to renew, it was more like it's a hundred years for the family kind of a thing, and then it'll expire. But at that time, I, I know that my aunt said they were worried about not having an American English speaking copyright. And they sat down in their kitchen in Astoria in their old rent controlled building, beautiful apartment. And I'm sure I, I can see them in my mind sitting at a, table banging this thing out and actually sitting there and my my aunt spoke she spoke english fluently my uncle spoke english less fluently and um and writing it all down in english so that they could have a copy that could be copyrighted um but of course that the thing was then it was kind of interesting i'm not really sure what the draw was for the folks in um Sarasota at the Oslo Theater, but that was where the where the where Parfumery premiered as the adaptation that I had put together. Um, they had someone there knew the play and asked our agent, who's been the same agent for a couple of generations. Uh, it's the lady who's the agent now, uh, the Martone agency, Tonda Martin. It was her aunt, Elizabeth Martin, that was the agent for my uncle back in, you know, the earlier 1900s. Um, there was an inquiry from the Oslo. Could, is there any, how do we get our hands on the English translation of this play? We'd like to do it. Um, and uh, our agent asked me, she said, did I have an English translation? I said, yeah, I, I have the one my aunt did. Um, should we engage a translator to do it again? What do you want to do? An adapter? Da, da, da. So, but I, I said, let me look at the script to begin with. Let me, so I looked through the script, uh, read through it. And as conversations that I've had with other people, it was interesting to observe that this was a word for word translation. You could see that, you know, there were things that were just being transcribed from the Hungarian and Frankly, they didn't didn't really work in English. Um, a lot of the and but to me, you know, and as I say, part of this is ego because I'm not a playwright. I've written some, I've, I've written some ten minute plays that got produced and things like that. But no, I was I've been an IT person my whole life. Um, I was an undergraduate music major, but I ended up in IT for most of my working all of my working career. Um, but I looked at this thing and I've done you know, a fair amount of community theater. 
So I'm familiar with the stagecraft and the way things should flow. As I said, enough enough ego to have looked at this and said, you know, I know what this is supposed to be funny right here. This this line right here is supposed to be funny, but they're t- they're they're telling the joke wrong. It was like you know, and people don't laugh. And they said, well, it was funny, but he doesn't know how to tell a joke. The translations, a lot of them, did not tell the joke properly. So, and I felt that I could tell the joke properly. So I actually picked through the whole script. I rewrote a lot of things um, that were regular dialogue. And I also, what I say is fixed the humor, hopefully, um, to uh, be funny. And then there were also a couple of other things too that uh, were involved, like um, Hammerschmidt had, there wasn't a real good resolution at the end for him in terms of um, resolving with his wife, it, it, he never really explained himself. Um, he, it, it was kind of an old fashioned, old world sort of approach of, well, yeah, okay, uh, well, maybe we'll get together again, you know. And I, I wanted there to be more of a, of a recognition of, of, of fault, if you will, in terms of taking responsibility. And so I had, I wrote some nice uh, dialogue for Hammerschmidt at the end of the play uh, where he discusses this with George and talks about the shop being, you know, his mistress. Um, and, um, and also the, the big amazing thing and every adaptation since the original play has done this is that at the end, he tells Amalia that he's the her dear friend, that he's the guy that's been corresponding with her. In the original play, he does not tell her. Wow, that, that, that's that's yeah. really interesting because you're right. Every version that I've seen, he, he spills the beans. Of course. Makes it together, yeah. Of course. But in the original play, again, these are sensibilities of a person who was born in, you know, 18 whatever and 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 living in 1930s uh hungary and in europe which is again a different culture um his explanation when sipo says you're going to tell her in the original play he says oh no um she's a woman and and she'd have an, a breakdown a nervous breakdown i can never tell her because she would be broken and wow. i was like did, <laughs> now but did, did those two characters get together and he Yes. They get together? Okay, they get so, together. He, so he kept the secret. He kept the secret. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> but that's like the fun part. That's the best fun part is when he tells her, oh my God, it's you. <laughs> yeah. Um, so your uncle, uh, I'm, and I hope I don't mispronounce him, uh, Miklos Laszlo. Perfect. Uh, that, thank you. Um, from conversations you and I have had previously, you mentioned that uh, he wrote this uh, with the, uh, I think, I, I guess we could say the guy that Hammerschmidt is supposed to be the main character. And and you, and you he was a bit disappointed that some of the adaptions sort of uh, kind of centered on the ingenue and the, the, the couple. Um, did he have some sort of affinity for Hammerschmidt? Well, I, I have to believe that he did, um, only because he was so intent all the time. I mean, that was a that was a point of contention for him. As much as he loved having his work produced, that he would then say, "But you know, the complaint was that you know I wrote this about Hammerschmidt. Hammer, this is Hammerschmidt's show, not the kids. You know, so and and Hammerschmidt has always been sort of lowered in the hierarchy of importance in in all adaptations. So that was also a motivation for me in writing some scene chewing stuff for Hammerschmidt at the end of the plays that that he could get his due and that my uncle would be happier that this was happening. So so the play is set in 1937 in in Budapest. Um and that was a pretty tumultuous time in Europe. Uh slight undertones uh when the policeman comes in and and speaks of a curfew uh there's obvious financial problems for some of the characters uh is your uncle kind of sending a little message about the the time or was it just happens to be that that was the time and and he just wrote about it 
Well, you know, understand also he was a Hungarian Jew who had been born there. Um, Hungary was going through the Great Depression just like everybody else in the world was. And who did they align themselves with for economic recovery was Nazi Germany. Um, they actually, I only read this recently, Hungary became an actual official Axis power in 1938 um, and then tried to take it back <laughs> because, you know, I guess they were they, there was a significant recovery and then they realized that they were on the wrong side of history and they tried to take it back. And uh, in I think 19, I was reading, as I say, reading this recently, 1944, and they established an armistice with Russia that they were ending their relationship with Nazi Germany and that they would uh, align themselves as an ally with Russia. And the Nazis kidnapped the premier's son and held him until the premier revoked that armistice for Hungary. And then shortly thereafter, the Nazis marched into Hungary and took, you know, fully occupied Hungary, not just as a, they were a par partner, they were now an occupied nation. So, you know, that's what happened. So now here it is. I mean, he's writing this in 37, 36, and this Nazi thing starts in 38. And they're already, you know, I, I'm sure that he had no desire to call attention perhaps to the, to some of the world politics that were in play because it was, it was very, it would have been very negative for the Hungarian people. And they, you know, you get the impression that they realized they made a mistake, but you know, it's a little, it was a little late for that. So, you know, he, and then he emigrated to America. Thank goodness he got out of there fast enough because um, while the Nazis, while they were an, an ally, the, uh, the Jewish population was left alone. But in 1944, right after 1944, they started to round up Jews in Hungary and send them to the gas chambers. So um, yeah, tumultuous time. Yeah, sure was. That, yeah, that's amazing that they got out when they did. And uh, thank God and uh, he was able to share this with the world. Uh, absolutely wonderful. Um, yeah, I think he would, you know, what I, if, if I would make one more comment about that, it would be, I think he was trying to capture perhaps the last moments of a, a different time, a time that he was familiar with. Um, as much as things were changing, there was still a great deal of the Hungary and the Budapest that that he grew up in and knew. And he, I think he was trying to maybe get a snapshot of that before it was gone. Well, and also the, the adaptions don't seem to include that kind of undertone that this play does with it. It's, it's very subtle. It really is that, you know, the policeman coming in and everybody talk about, I, I just think that they, they bubble gummed it up for Hollywood Oh, sure. And Broadway. So Sure. I agree. Yeah. Um but any plans any plans to produce perfumery, hope maybe in New York, professionally, Broadway or anytime in the near future. Or distant well, future. Um there have been I, I went back and looked, there have been eight professional productions um all around the country. Um most the the big ones were the ones right at the beginning, which was the Oslo Theater in Sarasota that produced it. And then, interestingly, the Wallace Annenberg Center for the Performing Arts chose Parfumery to be their very first stage production in the brand new Wallace Annenberg Performing Arts Center. And the that was dumb luck. That was the fact that the building that the Annenberg Foundation took over and restored was an old post office. So they retained the early 1900s uh, beautiful facade, what had been the you know marble and and columns and the beautiful kind of architecture from the 1930s, 20s um, of that building, and they used that for their offices and their box office. And then beside it on that property, they built a state of the art. They built two state of the art theaters where they produce plays, orchestras, ballet, whatever whatever it may be. All of the arts are supported in those structures. And those structures were decorated on the outside with a, a relief um, covering that actually consists of twisted envelopes. If you ever see a picture of the Wallace Annenberg theaters, it's it looks like a bunch of 
dots, you know, things on the slide, but it's actually twisted envelopes. And the, my understanding is someone said, well, you know what we should do here for our first place? Something that has to do with the mail. And consequently, perfumery came up because someone maybe had just seen it in Sarasota a couple of years before. And so, like I say, that was just luck that uh, we got to be the opening theater presentation for the Wallace Annenberg Center for the Performing Arts. Wow. Um, uh, what, where, what city is that located in? Um, uh, Beverly Hills. Ah, okay. Yeah, Wallace Annenberg Foundation built a nice theater for the poor people of Beverly Hills who just didn't have it. <laughs> Yeah, let's be rough for that neighborhood. <laughs> um, I understand that your uncle put in a couple of Easter eggs in the story. <laughs> um, no, he didn't. I did. Oh, uh, okay. That was you. Okay. That's yeah. outstanding. So uh, again, I, I am trying to respect my uncle's presence in this and my great fortune in being able to participate in this because you know i mean people call me the author i'm i am an adapter i took his words and my aunt's english translation and i'm i'm an editor um and i hopefully i did a good job and as i said i wrote a couple of things in that weren't there that you know like the reveal and like the hammerschmidt speech at the end but pretty much an adapter and um I wanted them, I wanted their spirit to still be present in the play. And um, am, I, am I telling the secret here in, in this thing? This is okay. Um, Absolutely. Good. Please tell the secret. This is the time to do it. There, you know, there just are. Don't the away, yeah, there are just boxes. don't give away too much in case somebody hadn't seen this, which I can't believe somebody hasn't seen this story in one of its iterations <laughs> their box numbers just were to me random numbers who knows maybe they had significance to my uncle but i suspect they were just random numbers but i decided to actually not make them random and i made his box number and her box number their actual birth dates not the year but the month and day so my uncle is was uh may 20th so his box is 520 and her birthday was uh, December 22nd, so she ended up being box 1222. So that's just a, a fun little detail. And I felt like that keeps their spirit in the in the play, you know? I, I This will be the second time that I'm directing this play, and I agree with your uncle. Uh, the first time I did this, I, I made sure that Hammerschmidt, the actor who played Hammerschmidt, got the final bow because I thought the story was more about him than the actual Anjanu couple, you know, whereas the other entities right. had, had focused on that. Um, that being said, uh, we actually have two of our actors uh, who are kind of watching, and I don't know if they have any questions, but I'm going to ask them to uh, come in and bring their video on if they can, because I know they're listening. And um, unmute yourselves. And uh, would you? Uh, I, I want to introduce uh, first of all uh, Barry Leonard. He's playing the uh, character of Shipos. Um, I'm going to bring this into uh, gallery view. Here we go. And Lou Gantwerk, who is playing Miklos Hammerschmidt. I noticed that's his first name as well as your uncle. Yeah. Was that yeah. you or was that him? Well, I think that was him. <laughs> it was him. Okay. He also played, I... he actually played the part too. So maybe he he uh didn't want to, you know, go, what are you talking to me? It was like so he made it <laughs> Miklos. So somebody said Miklos, they know it was him. He know it was him. Well, that's why I asked uh, asked you earlier um in a previous conversation we had is if it was any autobiographical uh, sense with him, but you said it was just you said it wasn't, so that's fine. But <laughs> he was a he was a playwright. He was uh, very popular in Hungary before he left. In the you know he was writing short plays. The thing that I he actually worked in sort of a cabaret uh, kind of a atmosphere most of the time. But he did also write uh, with you know with short like interlude kind of plays. I remember remember Love American Style that yes. boat, a boat thing. And there would be the main story. And then in between, there would be these like 30 second kind of little skits. And that to me is kind of what he was doing only on a longer basis. So his skits, a lot of them were 
10 minutes, 12 minutes uh, in between other things. But then he wrote a, a large number of other full length plays that were also produced um, in a particular theater in Budapest. And then he came to this country and um, had less success. So it's like he was he was a fish out of water, I think, in New York City. Uh, so Barry and or Lou, uh, do you guys have a question for our adapter, the editor, not not the author? <laughs> <laughs> well, I enjoyed very much reading it, your, your adaptation. And after I read it, I went back to watch the first movie. And uh, I've, I've noticed that maybe from the movie, going back then to your play, that it's really two stories. You were saying before, Rob, that Hammerschmidt was supposed to be the main character and the story was about him. But there's actually two separate stories going on. One is the romance over there. And then you have the Hammerschmidt crisis in his life. And I love the way they meld, but they really are two separate stories. Do you agree with that? Oh, yeah, definitely. I, you know, my like I say, my uncle's only objection, if you that's maybe too hard, harsh a word, um, was that he had written that other storyline and that other storyline in the movies was pretty much ignored. Um, you know, there's some mention, but it's not it's not like he gets to he doesn't really get to be a, a, a dramatic actor in either of those movies. He's more of a comic character. So. I think that may have been what uh, may have bothered him a bit. So in the play now, we're we're back to the original. So that's cool. So uh, first of all, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. It's so interesting to get a bit of the background in a, in a, in a, a play that you're involved in. Um, so there was a scene um, early on after the uh, initial sort of introduction to the uh, to the shop and the various customers, and the policeman comes in and um, reminds uh, Mr. Hammerschmidt that uh, there is a curfew. And, it, and his answer is, we know. Thank you, officer. And to me, that was a, um, you know, depending on who's listening, either a subtle or not so subtle acknowledgement of sort of the beginning of, of, of the trouble, uh, so to speak, and, and that um, the, the curfew was, was definitely connected, I think, at least it seems to me, to the beginning of the, uh, the persecution of, of, of Jews in, in Hungary and, uh, and Hammerschmidt, sort of, you know, trying to protect you know, the shop and his people um around the whole issue of the sign being in the window and and all of that i thought was a you know a, a, a bit of a um it just was an interesting scene to me because i you know horvath doesn't just sees it as a uh, an issue of you know something else he has to do i think hammerschmidt sees it as something that's uh much more sinister i would agree i i think that you know well, that that it, it creates that sense that uh you know underlying all of this you know what i was contending earlier is this 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 snapshot this idyllic snapshot of the budapest that that had been that was going that it was going away that this was this is sort of like a an indicator that oh here's the real world people we're we're, we're becoming a unfortunately a fascist country and about to make things even worse that you know you have curfews and that there are troubles on the street and you want to control the population all of the population uh, let alone the jewish population and i i was wondering if you had some insight or something that um to say about hammerschmidt's relationship with arpad a young man who um you know screws everything up can't bring the breakfast on time or you know, in the right way. And yet he's incredibly kind and tolerant and, and um, you know, almost, you know, loving toward him, if Hammerschmidt could ever be described as loving. Yeah. It certainly comes out in, in that relationship. And I was wondering if there's some, what, what your thoughts are about, about their relationship. Well, I agree with you that that is the, 
the fatherly part of him coming out, you know, that Arpad is, is, is a son to him as George, yeah. George is actually a son to him. I mean, it's interesting because, you know, these are the, these are the positive sides of Hammerschmidt that, that work to the detriment of his marriage. These people, he, he loved these people as family. He felt that love for these people. And whether it was George, who to him was the heir apparent, or Arpad, who was the bumbling young man who he still had faith that he would come around, and he does. I mean, you know, Arpad steps up and, and is going to become a, a full contributing adult at the end of the at the end of the play. He's going to be a sales clerk as well. Um yeah, sure. And then of course, you know, I mean, I I won't I won't mention your last line, but for people who are watching who haven't seen the show, wait for that last line. It's it's exactly what a father would say in that situation. I, I love that. That last line lasts, I think, through all the ad adaptations as well. Uh, yeah, so, I, I love that last line. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's great. It's fun to do. Well, I, I have to say, this has been a, a wonderful little get together, guys. Um, uh, Barry and Lou, uh, I know I, I've been, we've been, we've known who was in our cast for about three months or more. And we are just starting our rehearsals next week. And uh, I can't wait. Uh, I've, I've worked with both of these gentlemen before. Lou has played the part of Hammerschmidt in our previous production, uh, which you may have seen some of the, the clips. So I'm so happy you gentlemen are here. Uh, uh, but most importantly, uh, I just want to thank Ed. I want to thank you for uh, all of the, with the back and forth we've had over the, the the past few months, you reaching out to me when you found out we were doing, doing your play and um, all the, the notes you've given us. Uh, and and it's just it's going to I think this is going to be a wonderful production. I can't wait. Uh, and thank you, every uh, each and every one of you for being here. Um, Rob, I want to say last thoughts. Yeah, Rob, I want to say thank you for your commitment to the play. I appreciate that. You know, not being a, an author by profession over the years and the number of productions that we've done, especially the two first professional pro productions, we made a number of changes and cuts and things that needed to be cleaned up. There was even some stuff that was perceived as being uh, really not uh, not um, not socially appropriate. Um, I had found some things like that too. I mean, interestingly, I remember the there's a moment when Hammerschmidt, uh, when he is um, incapacitated and he's working, he's living in the shop for a couple of days, and. Arpad in the original play suggests that he move in with him and his family and Hammerschmidt is beside himself with laughter that <laughs> imagine me moving in with poor people like you um, and I, I modified that to be something else you know that I think I changed it to like he has an apartment that he could rent and you know and I threw in an, another joke there about him being the handyman but it was just um, but I thank you Rob for your attention you have, you know, you went through it and you picked through it and found some inconsistencies like the uh, the uh, the bargain at the beginning of the play that wasn't a bargain where they said, hey, why don't you buy the bigger one? It's, you know, you'll get, it's more, it's twice the thing for less money. And it was completely backwards. It was more money. It was more money at the bigger, in the bigger size. So that's, you know, that's great to find those kinds of things and to realize that someone is is caring enough about the work that you're looking at it at that with that level of detail. So I thank you also, Rob. You're welcome. But again, thank you and thank everyone here. Uh, the play is called Parfumery. Uh, we're running at Kelsey Theater at Mercer County Community College from November 24th to December 3rd. It's Friday nights and Saturday nights at 8 p.m. and Saturday matinee and Sunday matinee at 2 p.m. Both weekends, eight performances. Uh, please make sure you uh, go to KelseyTheater.org. The theater is spelled with R-E at the end, as you see on your screen right now. 
and uh, go and buy those tickets and come out and see it. And um, I understand on opening night that this, the galas are back for those of you who know what they, those are. And Ed should be there and he'll be out in the gala with everyone uh, to talk to the audience and actors as well. Uh, thank you very much for uh, joining us today. And uh, hopefully we'll see you on November 24th. Bye-bye, everyone.